Acts chapter 26 and verse 19. Paul is speaking before King Agrippa. And he makes a very profound statement that I want to start with tonight as we teach. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Uh-huh. So he was speaking to King Agrippa. And he called it a heavenly vision. Please go back to, um, yes, 20. I'm not sure. Okay, that's fine. No problem. We'll just pick it from there. The God's end time program affects three groups of people. Three groups of people. Number one, God's end time agenda affects the world of sinners. The world of unbelievers. It's important for us to know um, the targets as far as God's program is concerned. Number one, God's end time agenda affects the world of sinners. These are the first people groups that were mandated to reach the world of sinners or the world of unbelievers. Number two, God's end time program affects the saints, believers, there is a mandate to affect positively and to influence the saints. And then number three, God's end time program affects societies, territories, and nations. It's important we have this orientation that when we talk about God's end time program, there are three categories of people that this should affect. Number one, the world of sinners, unbelievers. Number two, the saints, believers. Number three, territories, communities, societies, and nations. And if we fail to reach any of these people groups, it will affect the potency of that mandate. Hallelujah. Now, believers are not given the liberty or witnesses now to choose which of these? Every one of these groups should be affected by the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit, and this grace that God has deposited upon our lives. The Great Commission, as we know, has brought a lot of confusion to the body of Christ. The average believer cannot articulate with intelligence what um, we call theologically the Great Commission. Many will talk about evangelism and stop there. But the Great Commission captures these three dimensions that I just explained. For many, even preachers, they understand the Great Commission uh, just to be evangelism. So they narrow the Great Commission to the world of sinners and they stop there. It's a very incomplete perspective. In fact, um, for you to understand the Great Commission, there are three scriptures you have to bring together. And if you isolate any one of these scriptures, it will not give you the complete picture of the Great Commission. Are we together? So let's consider the scriptures very quickly. Mark 16 from verse 15 to 20. Media, thank you for helping us again. Mark 16, thank you. And he said unto them, please pay attention, Go ye into all the world. Notice the statement. He never said go around. He said go ye into. Into. Not two words. Into. Are we together? And preach the gospel not to men, to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. Then whilst you do this, this sign shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, say amen. amen. They shall speak with new tongues, say amen again. Amen. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Amen. Reading to 20, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover even tonight. Amen. 
The Bible says, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. I like 20. It says, And they went forth in obedience to that mandate. They went forth and preached everywhere. Say everywhere. everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. Scripture number two. Matthew chapter 28 from verse 18 to 20. I hope my mic is fine. Matthew 28, all right? And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power. Well, um, let me just make an observation here. King James does not do justice um, to that word. The word there from the Greek is exousia. Is the word authority. All authority, okay? All authority is given unto me. Uh -huh, in heaven and in the earth. And it says in light of that information, this is another aspect of the Great Commission. It says, go ye therefore. Now you notice Mark's account says, preach, declare, proclaim to every creature. Now Matthew's account now says, in addition to preaching, there is the teaching ministry and this is to all nations. Are we together? It says, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Uh -huh. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This is beyond evangelism. This is discipleship. Are we together? Yes. And while you are doing that, I am also with you. So the Lord was walking with those preaching and declaring. The Lord was also walking with those mentoring and providing discipleship. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Okay. Are we together? Lo, I am with you all way, even to the end of the world. Amen. Final scripture. Acts chapter 1, please. We're reading 6 to 11. Do you love scripture? Yeah. Right, so Acts chapter 1, 6 to 11. When they were come together, therefore they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Read with me verse 8. Ready? One to read. But ye shall receive power. Hallelujah. Ye shall receive power. Power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Uh -huh. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So in the book of Mark, you are sent to be preachers. In Matthew's account, you are sent to disciple nations. And in Acts chapter 1, you are sent to be witnesses, validators. You see that now? So, witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in all Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he spoke these things, they beheld him as he lifted and went to heaven. Now, when you put these scriptures together, they provide a holistic picture of God's idea of the Great Commission. So most times, and respectfully speaking, even theologians, they pick Mark's account and use it to construct their idea of the Great Commission. Then a few would delve to Matthew's account and then others would just narrow it down to Acts. You now see from these expressions that the Great Commission involves preaching, involves teaching and discipleship and it, it involves practical demonstration. Are we together? If you lose this understanding, you will not live an effective life as a witness. Now write this down, please. What is the Great Commission? I'll read and I'll request that you write. The Great Commission is a mandate 
given by Jesus Christ, a mandate given by Jesus Christ to the disciples and now to all believers. I'll dictate patiently because I need you to write this. The Great Commission is a mandate given by Jesus Christ to then the disciples and now to all believers to reach the entire globe. Am I too fast? I'll take it again. A mandate given by Jesus to the disciples and now to all believers to reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation to reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation put a comma there next to bring all nations to the knowledge of the truth through discipleship to reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation to bring all nations to the knowledge of the truth through discipleship and then to consequently bring territorial and societal transformation and then to consequently bring about territorial and societal transformation don't worry, I'll still read one more time. So the Great Commission is a mandate given by Jesus Christ to the then disciples and now to all believers to reach, number one, reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation. Number two, to bring all nations to the knowledge of the truth through discipleship. And then number three, to consequently bring about territorial and societal transformation. If you have this definition, then you understand God's idea. This is the Great Commission and this is also what we call God's end time agenda. Are we together? Yeah. So immediately you see and you learn that like I shared yesterday, there are three components to the Great Commission, not one. I'm recapping that which I said yesterday. Number one, world evangelization. Remember? So this affects the world of sinners. World evangelization. To ensure that if possible, every one sinner left on earth, that he comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Number two, discipleship. That is the biblically recommended pathway to transformation. Discipleship, the word discipleship is very important because it's, it's really an old expression of the word mentorship. It's the strategy that turns a student to have to be of stature like the lecturer or like the mentor. Are we together? Yes, this is very important. Discipleship. And then number three, which is my emphasis tonight, territorial or societal transformation. Let me tell you this. If you are a man of God, if you are a pastor here, and you want to serve the purposes of God effectively, it's important for you to understand that this is the jurisdiction of your mandate. Are we together? That there is an aspect of your mandate to reach the world of sinners there is an aspect of your mandate to mentor mature and build believers then there is an aspect of your mandate to influence systems and structures to bring territories to help them adopt the value system of the kingdom i did say yesterday that there is the gospel as a message that saves but there is the gospel as a value system that transforms society. I was at Plymouth earlier today and we had the opportunity to go around, what do you, monument of the, what do you call that? 
monument of the forefathers i was so inspired you have no idea because that 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 i believe is a representation of the spirit of america the convictions that built your nation it impacted me so much i kept thinking all through as we drove back it's important for you to understand the spirit of the gospel god's mandate god's intent god's drive if you ignore the unbelieving world there's something you are doing wrong if you save the unbelieving world and you ignore the maturity of the saints there's something you're doing wrong if we do well in church falling down rolling and we leave society without the influence of the kingdom we're still doing something wrong this is the apostolic dimension to Christianity Lot was a godly man but Sodom and Gomorrah was a godless place and he still paid the price even though he was a righteous man it matters that our territories are we together that they adopt the value system of the kingdom Lot was about to lose his daughters because he was a righteous man in a bedeviled society so it matters that our territories also conform to the value system of the kingdom. Do you know that all the laws that we try to enact in the parliament, everything that tries to help people become civil and decent is a human attempt to produce Christ in men. Even though we will not admit that that is the mission, but it is an attempt to produce Christ in men. So we use all kinds of laws and policies to help shape their behavior so that they behave the best that they can be. But that's exactly why he gave us the word and he gave us the Holy Spirit. Are we learning now? So it's important for us to understand the Great Commission. My life changed when I understood this. I travel extensively and by the grace of God, I am all about these three. If you ever find me ministering the word, I'm ministering to the world of sinners, I'm maturing the saints through mentorship and discipleship, or I'm raising and training witnesses to penetrate systems and structures, influencing them with the value system of the kingdom. Hallelujah. This will help your prayer. So when you are praying for a revival, you have an idea of what you see. Most believers are not intelligent in their approach to spiritual things. We're just emotional. So when you are asking God to move, we do not even understand what we're saying he should do. What does it mean to move? What does it mean to create an awakening? Now your, your understanding has been constructed. When you cry for a revival, you are saying, Lord, visit the world of sinners. Let every sinner be captured and be turned to the saint. Let every saint rise to a point of stature and maturity to take their place in destiny. When you pray for the saints, you are praying that there be a transition from being a believer to being a witness. Only witnesses can fulfill the great commission, not believers. So there has to be that transition from a believer to a witness. A witness is a validator of a claim. Many of you here are, you know, maybe lawyers or practitioners of the law. You do not need a witness in the court of law until there is a contention over a matter. Am I right on that? And then the judge would say, bring your witness. And every witness comes with an evidence. So when... Jesus sends us as witnesses. There are many statements that Satan has made upon the earth using men. He's attempted to describe God as unfaithful. He's attempted to describe God as limited. Do you know that every sickness, every, every negative occurrence in the lives of men is a letter Satan is trying to write indicting the integrity of God? So he sends you for every healing. It's more than a demonstration that a man is powerful. It's a reply from heaven through men. I am still faithful. I am still mighty. When the barren receive children, it's beyond an endorsement that a man of God is anointed. It is God using men. 
to write that I can still be depended upon. That means God is counting upon you, counting upon me to rewrite certain things. Are we together now? Yeah. The Great Commission. For many of us, we've been ineffective as far as representing the purposes of God is concerned. And the reason is that many have been saved. But like I said yesterday, we have not contended for the principles that help us to become matured believers. God cannot trust us with his mandate in experience when we are still children. Void of understanding, void of stature in the spirit. There are certain assignments that cannot be given to us until we attain unto a state of maturity. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, an heir, for as long as he is a child, he differeth not from a slave, even though he be lord of all. It takes maturity to be trusted. Are we together? It says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon the shoulder of the son, not the child. Not the child. Are we together? Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. The Bible says, Jesus, your Jesus increased. Wow. Jesus increased. Increased in wisdom. Increased in stature. Increased in favor with God and man. Until he attained that state of maturity where he could be trusted with the destiny of mankind to redeem through death. Hallelujah. And so it's important for us to know that God desires for us to attain unto maturity. And now I want to give you three keys. Three keys that can help the believer attain unto maturity. And then I'll talk about one other aspect and we'll pray. Is God helping us already? Three keys. My God. For someone who will walk out of this place as a sign and a wonder already. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to give you three keys that can transit any believer from a weak spiritual state until you become a person of power and a person of grace. Are you ready? Number one, the first key is called a systemic prayer life. The first key that builds believers to become people of power and stature in the spirit is systemic prayer life. Notice the expression systemic. If your prayer life is not systemic, it will be ineffective and it will be void of the ability to build you. Systemic. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible tells us that Peter and John were on their way to the temple to pray at the hour of prayer. Please say that after me. The hour of prayer. One more time. The hour of prayer there was a discipline that was invested to their prayer life it was called the hour of prayer dedicated to prayer the hour of prayer most believers pray but aside from praying and miss we are not consistent in our prayer we have an emotional approach to prayer so when matters get bad and it looks like we're in trouble, we quickly develop some kind of crash system and we shout at the gates of heaven. And once it looks like there's a little solution, then we leave everything. Your prayer life, the power in prayer is in its consistency. Especially when we're talking about prayer as a tool for building you. I'll talk a bit on prayer. It's important we understand this. The key to benefiting from prayer is to create a strategy for consistency. The key to benefiting from prayer 
is to create a strategy for consistency. Most believers are not consistent in their prayer. Can I give you four assignments of prayer? Maybe you want to write that down. According to scripture, there are four assignments of prayer. Number one, the first assignment of prayer is for growth and transformation. This is the most important assignment of prayer. Did you know that the average believer's understanding of prayer is just as a means for receiving things from God? The major assignment of prayer is as a tool for your personal growth and transformation. Luke chapter 9, please, and verse 29. Are we learning? That means a major part of your prayer should not just be about asking things, but engaging for your spiritual development. This is why he gave us the prayer language. As he prayed, we're we still together. The fashion of his countenance was altered. Talk to me. And his raiment became white and glistering. This is what happened to Jesus as he prayed. This is what will happen to any believer as you pray. As he prayed, the fashion of his countenance, transformation, a weak you can become a strong you when you pray. A timid you a carnal you can become a spiritual you. You can pray out weakness, pray out limitation. Most believers have not used prayer as a tool for their development. Show me a man who has been methodically mentored to understand the ministry and the role of prayer in his development and has obtained grace to engage. I show you a powerful Christian in the making. Now, I hope you know that when the disciples of John became the disciples of Jesus, they noticed that Jesus' prayer produced power and they came to him and said, teach us to pray. Their issue was not prayerlessness. Their issue was that there was no power in their prayer. Everything he said came to pass. What was he saying? What was he doing? You must spend a major part of your prayer life praying in the spirit when you want to grow. Listen carefully. You must spend a major part of your prayer time praying in the spirit. Most believers do not use prayer as a tool for growth and transformation. It says you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But in Acts chapter 2, they receive the prayer language, not power. That means there is a relationship between that prayer language and the promised power. Am I right on that? If I tell you that I'm bringing you a hot meal and I bring you, say, a blue gift, it means you must open to find out there must be a connection between that gift I gave you and the promise I left you. Probably the meal must be inside. Am I wrapped? Are we together? If I promise you a thousand dollars and then I hand over a bag, it is only wise to open that bag because the thousand dollars will most likely be in there. As cash, as some voucher, as a check am i right on that so if jesus says you will receive power and what you receive was tongues you there has to be a relationship between engaging that prayer language and the release of power yes. hallelujah listen i'm saying this because i'm going to give you an assignment in righteousness you are going to work with the Holy Spirit to create a systemic pattern of consistent prayer from tonight. Yeah. Believe me, you walk this for one month, two months, three months, praying consistently every day for the purpose of edification and growth and watch the wonder you become. Do you believe this? So the first assignment of prayer 
is as a tool for growth and transformation. Number two, the second assignment of prayer is as a platform for obtaining requests and making petitions. Obtaining requests and making petitions. Obtaining requests and making petitions. God is Father. God is a giver. We can obtain requests. We can make petitions. Mark chapter 11, please, and verse 24. Here's what the Bible says. And what things soever ye desire. Is that in your Bible? It says, when ye pray. So there is a relationship between desires and prayer. It says, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Desire, prayer, believing, receiving, having. Desire, prayer, believing in prayer, receiving in prayer, having in experience. This is a dynamics. So prayer is a tool for making petitions and obtaining requests. The Bible even says, ask Matthew 7, 7, and you shall receive. Is that still in your Bible? Seek and you will find. Knock, it says, and it shall be opened unto you. I like verse 8. For everyone. Prayer is for everyone. For everyone, not some. Everyone that asketh in prayer receiveth. It says, ye have not because ye ask not. Are we still together? So assignment number one of the prayer ministry is for your growth, edification, and transformation. Number two, as a tool, a platform to obtain requests and to make petitions. Ready for number three? The third assignment of prayer as revealed from scripture is as a tool for creating your reality. Prayer when in combination with the spoken word, helps the believer create their reality. I like this. The Bible says, even God who quickened the dead and called those things that be not. I hope you know that the believer is a co-creator with God. You are given the responsibility of designing your destiny using the creative power of the spoken word in prayer. This must form a major part of your prayer life. Not just to ask, speak. Son of man, can these bones live? He says, only thou knowest. And then he said, prophesy. Speak to someone, say prophesy. prophesy. One more time, say prophesy. prophesy. Hmm. Now, isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit told Ezekiel what to say. The bones had what the Holy Spirit was saying and they did not move until Ezekiel spoke. I prophesied as I was commanded, he said, and there was a sound. So every time we prophesy in prayer, there is a sound. A sound, a sound, a sound, a sound of healing, a sound of restoration, a sound of revival, a sound of mending bones. Now listen, you would look at a valley, a valley that was full of bones. You would see the one bone here, the other bone there, the possibility for order was still there, even in the midst of chaos, but not under every condition. The moment the prophet prophesied, the bone came from everywhere to everywhere. The bone can mean the problem. The bone can mean whatever you desire, connecting itself until there arose an exceeding great army. Can I tell you, you do not know the kind of power you have as far as shaping your possibilities and creating your destiny is concerned until you know how to use scripture with the intelligence of an artist, you begin to draw your possibilities. Have you watched an artist paint? From nothing. Swiping the brush left to right at various angles. Not making sense at the beginning. Sometimes inverting the picture. Ah, and then when he's done, he turns it back. This is your destiny. 
So when you begin to make declarations like the Lord is my light and my salvation, of whom shall I be afraid of? Are we together now? Yes, sir. The psalmist said, I lay me down and I slept. I wake for the Lord sustain me. A thousand shall fall by my side, 10,000 by my right side, but none shall harm me. With my eyes will I see and behold the reward of the wicked. The Bible says, they that be planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God, that in old age they will be fat and flourishing. That is my destiny. That is your assignment in the place of prayer, to use the spoken word and push it with faith and begin to redefine your possibilities. When men say there is a casting down, for me my declaration is that there is a lifting up. Yes, sir. Believe this. This is how kings reign. He suffered no man to do them wrong. He reproved kings for their sake, saying, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. I'm planted in the house of God. I flourish in the courts of our God. In old age, I am fat and flourishing. No devil would take my life before my time. In the name of Jesus, I have a covenant of life. Did the Bible not say if they obey and serve him, they will spend their years in prosperity, their days in prosperity, their years in pleasure? I expect to be favored in any nation regardless my background because the Bible says, watch this, it says, let them shout for joy. Let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified which had pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. It is in my Bible that I am blessed in the city blessed not just in nigeria i am blessed in america i define my possibilities listen i'm teaching you how believers become matured i cannot be rejected not by any nation not by any people group the hand of god is upon my life i have the covenant of abraham working in me it says in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed this is what I believe. This is my reality. Please sit down. Do you believe this? Now you see, the requirement for prophecy is a thorough understanding of the promises of God. You cannot speak prophetically in ignorance because god is only committed to what he has said not what you want it is only when your desire becomes what god has said that it looks like god is answering you you see what god is answering is not really your desire he's honoring his word that you have found and connected to your desire because in this kingdom if God has not spoken, his anointing has no ministry. The assignment of the anointing is to insist that the word does not become a lie in your life. Genesis 21 and verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. God only visits as he has said. He only does as he has spoken. Did you get that? So if he has not said it, and if you cannot find where he has said it, there is no bit for performance in your life. The third ministry of prayer. Is someone learning? I refuse to be defeated. Not when I have this advantage in my life. No. 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 I define my possibilities. I don't wait for life to happen to me. That is a dangerous adventure. I can't risk my life. I have just one lifetime. I'm not going to put one lifetime at the mercy of wicked people, wicked systems. No. Job already taught us a lesson by being silent. I would be silent. I have to participate in every outcome that happens in my life. No devil will make any discussions and then I become a victim of operations of spirits and territorial powers. No. No. Discussions were concluded about Job and the Bible says on a certain day. The third assignment of prayer. You see that for many of you, 
your life has gone inconsistent with your desires because you are just allowing life to just happen. Now, when you leave a farm without planting, something will grow. What is it called? Please. One more time. Please. We define weeds in agriculture as unwanted plants, at least with respect to your farm. Unwanted. Hmm. Unwanted. Every tree that has not been planted by my father, it is my responsibility to uproot it. Are we together? So you find out that you're roaming over Boston and looks like doors are closed. Everyone hates you. Come on. Don't go around attracting sympathy. Lock yourself. You have an advantage. The prayer ministry. You pray in the spirit and you stretch your hands like the priest that you are and begin to make prophetic scripture based declarations. Here's what the Bible says. Is anyone afflicted? James 5.13 It says let him pray now watch this then it says let him call for the elders of the church my goodness i like this watch this it says and let them pray help that person under the anointing anointing him with oil in the name of the lord read verse 15 and never forget this scripture for the rest of your life the prayer of faith shall save the sick hold on and by the power of prayer the lord shall raise him up Prayer raises men up. The Lord shall raise him up through the prayer of faith. Raise him up from a nobody and put you in a global scale. Do you believe this? Listen, do not let contemporary society make it look like prayer is just an activity of fanatical Christians. You would be doing your destiny a disservice. He spake a parable to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So number one, praying in the spirit for your edification, growth, and transformation. Number two, using scripture-based prayer as a basis for obtaining requests and making petitions. Unto thee that answers prayer, the Bible says, shall all flesh come. Number three, creating possibilities in your life is like an art of legislating things you are enacting laws in the spirit and establishing them the bible says where the word of a king is there is power it says declare ye that thou mightest be justified don't be silent mm -mm. give him no rest until he establishes jerusalem as a praise number four the fourth and final assignment of prayer is for warfare and prophetic intercession i hope you believe in warfare <laughs> let me define for you what i call warfare warfare is a prophetic system of establishing the word of god and establishing the will of god over lives destinies and territories Warfare is concerned not just with fighting, but establishing realities that have been finished, making them manifest through the force of intercession. I'm going to be teaching you that because this is how you would take your territory. All the other aspects, excellence, leadership, value, you already have it. That missing ingredient is what I came to show you. We are learning from you the other aspects because we've gotten warfare and intercession well. Then we've left excellence, we've learned leadership, and so we are coming to borrow that. But in exchange, we're importing to you how to exert dominion upon territories using the power of priesthood. Elijah stood in one place, not in a radio station, not in a TV station, and he shot down rain. Listen, if you learn what I'm about to show you tonight, the spiritual forces that trouble the purposes of God over Boston will be in trouble after tonight. You see, Daniel was an intelligent leader. 
and Daniel understood the power of prayer now before the king he was a valuable person excellent intelligent an administrator the Bible says he had an excellent spirit but all that was strengthened because of his prayer so the spirits of the Medes and the Persians they needed to investigate what was responsible for this man's excellence and dexterity in life. They traced it to his prayer. Can you imagine that these spirits moved through men to enact one law against one man for just 30 days? They came through the angle of politics and governance to say for the next 30 days, no man would offer prayer to any God king. Sign this. And if anyone were found doing that, he will be thrown to the lion's den. The Bible says, Daniel opened the window. <laughs> Do you know why he opened the window facing Jerusalem? Because when Solomon was dedicating the temple, he entered a covenant with God that everyone who faced Jerusalem offering prayer, that the Lord should hearken to them. And Daniel began to pray. And when they found him, they threw him at the lion's den. You know the story. And he refused to die. I didn't say he didn't die. He refused to die. If life is a choice, then death. <laughs> mm. Are we together? You want to become a powerful believer? You must pray. Say in the name of Jesus. Name of Jesus I, obtain grace I obtain grace to pray. To pray. One more time in the name of Jesus. Name of Jesus I, obtain grace I obtain grace to pray. To pray. Can you pray in the spirit in one minute before we continue? In the name of Jesus. I obtain grace to pray. I obtain grace to pray. I obtain grace to pray. Prayerlessness, you let me go in the name of Jesus. Prayerlessness, you let me go in the name of Jesus. Obtain grace. Hallelujah. Now, very quickly, very quickly. The second secret for becoming a mighty man in the spirit is to be built by the word. Invest in the word of God. Invest in the ministry of the word. Prayer is powerful, but prayer without an understanding of the word will leave you only practicing religious superstition. What gives power to prayer is the word compliancy of your prayer. Did you hear that? What gives power to prayer is that it is scripture-based, word compliant, and consistent with the will of God. In fact, here's how the Bible puts it, that this is the confidence that we have, that when we ask anything in a accordance to his will we know that he heareth us so when you pray a miss regardless the kind of energy you dissipate there is a guarantee that it will not be answered hmm. are we together many believers pray and we do not get answers because we just pray emotionally superstitiously we just shout around and yet our prayer is not consistent with scripture the modus operandi in this kingdom is the word how things happen is by the word God's method has always been his word his method to lift his word his method to restore his word his method to bless his word the moment you ignore the word of God and try to get God's result you are not a Christian again the only way God's result comes to you is in compliance to his word now, the Bible essentially contains promises, principles, and prophecies. Never forget this. 
every time you study your Bible you are interacting with these three realm of realities principles promises God's commitment to you principles the modus operandi of the kingdom prophecies guiding you to navigate your path through life and destiny are we together did you get that so when you open your Bible you're interacting with promises the Bible calls them exceeding great and precious promises you're interacting with principles the Bible calls them the mysteries of the kingdom Matthew 13 11 it has been given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven and then you're interacting with prophecy most believers do not invest in the word listen let me tell you this ladies and gentlemen you must obtain grace to study the word of God why do you need to study the word of God because it is important for you to know what God has said that is the basis of your victory even Satan functions by knowing what God has said he depends on what God has said to you to attack you go to the book of Genesis when he came to man his first interest was not to attack what did God say because that becomes the basis for my attack the way Satan fashions weapons is that the weapons have to be anti-Christ anti-scripture are we together he needs to know what God has told you okay God has said you're going to become a great woman that becomes the basis of his attack God has said your third son will be a prophet he will make sure you get barren at that third pregnancy Satan only attacks with respect to the speakings of God's word. So if you see Satan coming around your vicinity, is proof he's aware that the word has reached you, even if you are not aware. His presence is confirmation that the word of God has come to you. <laughs> That's why he's called the thief. What is he coming to steal? You think he comes to your life to steal things? Oh no. Things only leave because the word left. John 1 3. All things were made by him, the word, and without him was not anything made that was made. Am I right on that? Yeah. This is powerful. That means if you give yourself to the study of scripture, Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, it says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, it says, and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. You must damage spiritual ignorance from your life. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18 having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their minds you need knowledge say knowledge, knowledge. please shout it say knowledge knowledge. Now, knowledge that was the true light Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1 says arise shine why that is the only reason why you will arise because your light has come not because you are tired of staying in that state time does not change anything it only reveals the consequences of your decisions if you want things to change you must bring light John 1 5 and the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not let me quote Isaiah 60 and verse 1 from Amplified beautiful rendition here's what it says arise from the depression and the prostration that circumstances have kept you rise to a new light hmm. are we together now listen the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 the creation story that God called the light day and the darkness he called night walk with me he called the light and the darkness he called night. one more time he called the light Day. and the darkness he called night. so in God's economy the day is not 6 a.m. 12 a.m. 3 a.m. the day is not when the Sun shines 
the day for you is when your light comes are we together so you can chronologically as we call it you can be at noon and yet you are still in the night and the Bible says with the night comes weeping so when you want to end your night you don't wait for the Sun to rise you bring light because it is only joy is connected with light connected with the morning are we learning now he called the light day and the darkness he called night so for many of us the Sun as we know it and as we call it um, the layman's understanding rising and setting rising and setting but in the realm of the spirit you've never really had day it's always been night because light has not come and for someone you may be living in the night and yet your experience is that of the day because of the abundance of the light listen go back to the word what has God said concerning your health what has he said concerning your finances what has he said concerning your influence are we together the Bible says in Psalm 81 verse 5 they know not neither will they understand they walk on in darkness and all the foundations of the earth are out of course verse 6 says I have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High but verse 7 says you shall die like mere men and fall like one of the princes I made a covenant with my destiny years ago that I would not be ignorant of the word. I knew my life depended on it. I found your word and I did eat it. It became a joy and a rejoicing to my soul. Please invest in scripture. I cause the spirit of laziness spiritually. Are we together? Wake up in the night and open your Bible. There are three ways to maximize the ministry of the word number one study it number two confess it number three listen to it you have to study the word study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needed not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word then listen to it faith comes by hearing get materials and we, we we live in an age where it is it is so easy there's there's all kinds of devices there are the speakings of jesus faith confessions on healing faith confessions on your destiny all you need to do is go online and pick it up you don't i mean they've saved you the the, the labor of piecing them together my phone is full of all kinds of scriptures and sometimes while i'm praying i let it play I may not be conscious, but it's entering into my spirit. I'm not listening for awareness. I'm transporting it to my spirit. Are you learning? So you study scripture, you listen to scripture, and you speak. Don't miss the speaking part. You're not maximizing the ministry of the word if you are silent. Let the redeemed of the Lord let the healed of the Lord let the blessed of the Lord let the great by the Lord let the children of the Lord let the witnesses of the Lord it matters that you say so the righteousness that is of faith speaks it is not silent say so say so I am blessed say so anointed by the Spirit say so Number three, the third key to becoming mighty in the spirit is that you must contend for spiritual empowerment. You must contend for spiritual empowerment. Is God helping us tonight? You want to be witnesses, you want to be men and women of stature. This was the apostolic model that was handed over to the church. It is not something to alter. It is a pattern. It will not change. The ministry of prayer in all its ramifications, the ministry of the word, studying the word, speaking the word, listening to the word to feed your spirit man, then now you come to the place of the anointing. Are we together? 
Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and the Bible says he went about doing good someone say doing good doing one more time say doing good it takes more than a kind heart to do good. It takes more than empathy and compassion to do good. You need to be anointed to do good. Doing good and healing all day that were oppressed of the devil. The Bible says, for God was with him. The Messianic prophecy, Isaiah chapter 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, says, for the Lord hath anointed me. And now it begins to list. To preach glad tidings to the poor. He had sent me to bind up the broken hearted. Look at the category of people. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of prison. This is very interesting. That means there are men who seem to be free physically. But in the realm of the spirit they are in prison. All kinds of prisons to them that are bound let's finish the scripture verse 2 the Bible says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord all by the anointing and the day of vengeance of our God verse 3 to comfort all who mourn by the anointing to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion by the anointing to give them beauty for ashes my God the oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise still by the anointing for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called the trees or the oaks of righteousness the planting of the lord that he might be glorified i receive i manifest you know the song your power and your wisdom Till the nations see Jesus lifted up, exalted. I receive, I manifest. That's your destiny, your power, and your wisdom. Till the nations see Jesus. Lifted up, glorified. Breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe upon my life. Breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe upon my life. Listen, I don't have the time to tell you how this prophetic song came. It's become an anthem in our ministry. It's the richest capture, a definition of our assignment at its core. The anointing becomes for us the power of God and the wisdom of God. You want to reveal Christ? You need the wisdom of God and the power of God. If you have power alone, the cosmos will drive you. The anointing can translate to wisdom and translate to power. This is why we can deliver a lecture in the afternoon and heal the sick in the night. Wisdom, power. Wisdom, power. Wisdom, power. Are we together? 